Okay, so uh, I see that we are now officially on, so I guess we can start it. Uh, I'd like to wish a good afternoon to our Brazilian colleagues, uh, to all our colleagues from South America, a good evening to uh, Professor Lisa Herzog, uh, or even a good morning, uh, depending on uh, which different, different time zone uh, the attendees are watching us. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome all of our colleagues here today uh, and to open this first web seminar on the subject Hegel and politics, new perspectives. Uh, this is the first of a series of web seminars organized around our journal or philosophy journal Hegel Studies here from Brazil. Uh, the journal Revista Eletrônica Estudos Hegelianos and more specifically uh, the seminars are based on the two last issues of Hegel studies, the issues we called Hegel and politics, new perspectives, and uh, that were published from 2018 on. So the idea of this web seminars is to uh, promote and to discuss the works and the studies about Hegel's political philosophy made by scholars from all over the world and who publish their works in our journal. Today we have with us Professor Lisa Herzog and for the next months until the end of the year we, we will also uh, be able to welcome other professors uh, such as Professor Norbert, Norbert Vazek, Professor Frank Huda, Professor Paulo Arantes uh, and the exact dates of our next seminars you can find soon on your on our Facebook page and also uh, on the internet page of the journal Hegel Studies. Uh, I also need to mention that these seminars are being organized by uh, my colleagues, the editors of the issues Hegel and Politics, who are also present here today. So we have uh, in this kind of backstage uh, Emmanuel Nakamura, uh, I will ask him to make a quick introduction of himself so that all of our colleagues can see you, Manu. Um, yes. Uh, yes, um, um, my name is Emmanuel Nakamura. Um, I'm a postdoc uh, researcher at the um, Univers University from Campinas, uh, Unicampi. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Lisa for accepting the, the invitation and to thank Poliana for all the organization for this event. Thank you, Manu. Also, as a, an, uh, a member of the organizing committee, we have Professor Ricardo Criciuma here with us. Ricardo, if you can make a quick introduction of yourself. You have your microphone unable. You need to unable. Now, now I think that uh, is okay. So, um, good afternoon, all. Um, um, I am also a professor here in Porto Alegre, but uh, actually in the um, URCIS, uh, uh, University of Rio Grande do Sul. Uh, I am professor of political philosophy. And I am also an, an editor of the online uh, uh, Hegelian studies here uh, of Brazil. So it's a great uh, pleasure to welcome Lisa and have you all here to this first lecture of our cycle on Hegel and politics. Thanks, Ricardo. Also, as a member of the organizing committee here with us, Professor Inácio Helfer. Inácio. Okay. <clears throat> I am Inácio Helfer and I, I work uh, at the uh, Unicinos, University Unicinos at uh, São Leopoldo. And uh, I work uh, with uh, Hegel politic uh, philosophy and it's very, very good here. Thank you. Great. Uh, we have also another member of the organizing committee, 
professor Fábio Nolasco. He is professor at UNB, Universidade de Brasília. And uh, unfortunately, he couldn't be here uh, with us today, but he will certainly be, uh, be here for the next two months. Uh, I also would like to mention that we have uh, the very important support of our Hegel's working group, uh, GT Hegel in AMPOF. This is the National Association of Philosophy Research and also the support uh, of Hegel's Brazilian Society. So I'd like to thank them for backing us up uh, on this idea. And uh, I couldn't fail to mention uh, in behalf of the, all the uh, members of the organizing committee that uh, we also would like to dedicate this seminar uh, to the memory of Professor Marx Mueller, who unfortunately passed away last week and uh, who left a priceless contribution to Brazilian philosophy and uh, especially to the academic studies on Hegel and Marx. So before I give the floor to our guest professor today, Professor Herzog, I'd like to uh, give a quick explanation about how this seminar is going to work and uh, about some technical questions around it. Uh, first, I will hand over to Professor Herzog, who will have up to 45 minutes to, uh, to do her, her presentation, her exposition. And uh, after that, uh, I will make I'll make the first intervention and uh, I will uh, ask a few questions, open uh, the debate, and then uh, uh, we will open to the other questions of the attendees who joined us here uh, through the platform teams. So the attendees can write down their questions anytime. Uh, we ask you to write your questions in English uh, and through the feature chat here from the Teams platform. For those who, uh, uh, who are using Teams for the first time, uh, you need uh, to enable the feature chat. It's uh, right below the screen uh, on the toolbar uh, with the button uh, with a question mark symbol. So you just need to, uh, uh, to touch on this button and then you will be able to uh, ask your question. In case there are partic participants who uh, joined us anonymously, I'd like to ask them to identify themselves in case they want to ask a question, uh, just informing their name and also if it is the case, if it's possible, also to inform the university to which they belong to. After Professor Herzog's presentation, we will gather and organize the questions and then forward it to her. Uh, a less important uh, technical point for those who could be interested, we are providing certificates for the seminars. So for those who want it, uh, you just have to fill in the form uh, at the link which Andresa will uh, make available uh, in the chat here in Teams. Well, I think now we can uh, finally move on to the seminar itself. So today, as I said, uh, we have the great pleasure to uh, welcome Professor Lisa Herzog. She's a professor at the Center for Philosophy, Politics and Economics of Groningen University in the Netherlands. Uh, her research themes lie in the intersection of political philosophy and economics. She authored a large number of works, so I will limit myself to name just a few. Uh, among, among others, she published Inventing the Market, Smith, Hegel and Political Theory uh, from 2013. In German, Freiheit gehört nicht nur den Reichen, 2014. And more recently, in 2019, she published, also in German, uh, Politische Philosophie and uh, Die Rettung der Arbeit, ein politischer Aufruf. We also translated one of her texts to the last issue of Estudos Hegelianos, the Hegel Studies, uh, the text Two Ways of Taming the Market, published originally in 2015 as a chapter of the collection Hegel and Capitalism. Uh, it was published by Andrew Buchwalter and Sunny Press, who were very kind to allow us the translation. Uh, so after this introduction, I'd like to once more to thank and to give the floor to Professor Lisa Herzog. OK, 
Hey, thank you very much for having me. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. OK, so I will start sharing my screen. So I have some slides um, and I'll talk through the paper and then I look very much forward to the discussion with you. So ooh, let me see now. Um, do you see my screen? Yeah, we can see it. It's not in presentation okay. mode. Yes, I'll do that. Hang on. Now it should be. Yes, perfect. Wonderful. OK, great. So this paper, Two Ways of Taming the Market, started in around 2008 when the great financial crisis happened and philosophers who usually worked on all kinds of other topics turned to questions about the economy, including Hegel scholars. And of course, there are many questions one can then ask. Can we understand the passages in Hegel that are about the economy and make sense of them today? Hegel is often perceived as a thinker of the state, not so much the economy. So does it make sense to read him with questions about the economy in mind? What did he actually know about economic thinking in his day? And can we gain anything from looking at Hegel when our questions are also about the economy? And in this paper, I discuss some aspects where I think one can actually find some quite interesting insights which help to yeah, sort of correct a certain one-sided picture that um, many economists in particular have of human behavior. So I will focus on the late Hegel, the Hegel of the philosophy of right, which he published in 1820 and 21. And there he has this long section about civil society. And he says this is the realm where modern society grants individual subjective freedom and particularity. So individuals can indulge themselves in all directions to satisfy their needs or their contingent arbitrary will, their subjective caprice, as he says. And then individuals encounter one another in instrumental relationships where they pursue their own interests. But it all happens within a framework of positive law and everyone can do what they like. And you get this fear that looks very chaotic with lots of contingent circumstances, as he says, and yet there are some sort of structures in this. So for Hegel, the market economy, which he sees it as a distinctive element of modern, in contrast to ancient society, is both potentially destabilizing and yet also to be welcomed because of its effects for subjective freedom. But he's also very critical because it leads to social inequality. He, has a, he says it affords a spectacle of extravagance and misery, so it drives society apart. It leads to certain forms of corruption. And in the end, it can only be part of a society if it is superseded by the political sphere, the sphere of the state, which comes after the realm of civil society in the architecture of the philosophy of right. But already in the realm of civil society, there are these two institutions that Hegel sees as necessary institutions for taming and sort of embedding the market. And Hegel calls them on the one hand, the, um, the police and on the other hand, the corporations. And he describes both of them as elements of what he calls the external state or the state of necessity and the state of understanding. So in this paper, I will go and look at these two ways in which Hegel thinks markets can be tamed and embedded. First, I will look at this role of the police and see how Hegel thinks that the laws of the market can be sort of directed and partly embedded by the role of the police. And that's what I call for simplicity, the economic perspective on human behavior. 
But then he also has the corporations. And here again, for simplicity, I will talk about the sociological perspective that he also takes on. And I will argue that although he took up some economic insights of his time, with a sociological perspective, he really went beyond many other thinkers of his day who thought about economic issues. And there is a nucleus of a theory here about how preferences and identities are shaped in the social realms that arise in a modern economy. And in the conclusion, I will then show that these two models are still present in modern approaches to economic ethics. I'll, I'll focus on a few German thinkers, but I think one can also generalize this point. And I think that it's very fruitful to focus in particular on the second, the sociological perspective. And if there is some time left or you know, if, if you're interested in this in the discussion, I can say a bit more about how this has led me to thinking and writing about workplace democracy uh, via a few other steps, um, but it started with thinking about Hegel and the corporations for me. So first, Hegel and the laws of the market. So I have a picture here, some planets, and that's because Hegel compares the laws of the market to the planet. So he says, when you look at this system of needs, the free market, we are first very confused and it seems a sphere in which individuals just do what they want. Everyone has their particular preferences and wishes. And at first sight, it seems incredible that one can find any kind of regularity in this realm. But then he says, in these irregular movements of the market, we can compare this to the irregular movements that the planets seem to offer the human eye from the perspective of a human astronomer. But it's only apparent chaos because in reality there is some kind of regularity here. And I here have a long quote, but I think it's worth reading this out because it really contains some of the core messages here that of, of, he of how Hegel view the market and the way in which economists at his time had thought about it. So here is the quote. Political economy is the science which starts from this view of needs and labor, but then has the task of explaining mass relationships and mass movements in their complexity and their qualitative and quantitative character. This is one of the sciences which have arisen out of the conditions of the modern world. Its development affords the interesting spectacle, as in Smith, Say, and Ricardo, of thought working upon the endless mass of details, which confronted at the outset and extracting therefrom the simple principles of the thing, the understanding effective in the thing and directing it. So I'll try to unpack what Hegel is doing here and connect this to the other thinkers that he here mentions, Smith, Say, and Ricardo. We know from Hegel's biography that he had already taken active interest in economic questions pretty early in his intellectual career when he was a, a private teacher in Bern. He was under the library there. Um, but it seems that he hasn't really read these other thinkers in a lot of detail. Um, and we don't really know whether he read them in the original or whether he might have read them just through literature reviews or other um, sources. So I'll take these different people and go through some of the central messages of their theories and then I'll compare that to what Hegel actually does. So first, Adam Smith here. Um, as you probably all know, Smith is, is often considered the founding father of economics. He was originally a, a moral philosopher and he is much more complex and much more interesting than the cliche that is still prevalent today. But Hegel actually had a sort of pretty stereotypical and cliched view of Adam Smith. So from Smith, Hegel adopts this idea that markets can coordinate human behavior and that in them, so, quote, subjective selfishness turns into a contribution towards the satisfaction of the needs of everyone else. 
that's what in Adam Smith in two passages is described by the metaphor of the invisible hand, this idea that the market directs individual self-interest towards the public good through this invisible hand. I mean, Smith is actually pretty cautious and uses it only twice in the thousands of pages he has written, but this metaphor is such a, you know, strong picture that it took on a life on its own. And Hegel sort of seems to adopt it. He also takes on another central idea from Adam Smith, namely that the division of labor can really increase productivity. And there's this famous example, which you find in Adam Smith, but already before Smith in the Encyclopedie and in other texts of the 18th century of the pin factory. And if, if one person tries to make pins from iron, that's very inefficient. But if a few people divide the work among themselves, they can produce lots and lots of pins. That was sort of the standard inventory example for division of labor. So that's also something that uh, Hegel takes on, but he doesn't take on all the other ideas that one also finds in Adam Smith. So Smith was pretty convinced with some qualifications that markets on the whole should be left to their own device and will self-regulate. So they will always find an equilibrium. Hegel does not quite believe this, and he doesn't believe that the price mechanism, which is so central in Smith, will lead to an automatic equilibrium. And in one of the Kreisheim lectures, one of the set of lecture notes that we have from the lectures he gave roughly around the time when he was also working on the philosophy of right, um, he actually explicitly mentions bakers and brewers, and there's probably an allusion to Smith's famous quote about how we um, get our dinner from the self-interest of the baker, butcher, butcher and brewer. So Hegel seems to be quoting Smith here, but he goes in a different direction because he says that it was not a good idea when the price for groceries in England was left to self-regulate without any uh, state regulation, and he's, he remains skeptical about this argument. Also, in Adam Smith, a central argument is that labor markets should be flexible. Everyone should be allowed to work in whatever way they want. It's a very anti-feudalist attitude in Smith, and Hegel is pretty skeptical about this. And as I'll um, discuss later, he is in favor of regulating labor markets through the corporations. Um, and also the way in which Adam Smith distinguishes different classes in society is a very sort of analytic view. So there are those who are um, producers, there are capital owners and there are workers. Whereas Hegel has a very traditionalist view of the different social classes. So there's agriculture and then there's um, trade and then people working for the state. So it's a much more if you like, phenomenological and not so analytic um, view of different classes. And finally, and that's probably the most important difference between the two here, Smith thought that if you let the free market do its work, there will be a more or less peaceful process of economic growth that will lead to the end of poverty. Everyone will benefit, um, even the poorest worker will have a growing standard of living. So if, if you like the, the sort of this optimistic story that if the economy is doing its work, everyone will benefit. And Hegel doesn't buy that. And he thinks that um, there will be more and more conflict, there will be class division, there will be a rabble of people who fall out of the regular labor process. Um, so he's very skeptical and he sometimes uses um, metaphors that are much closer to a sort of Hobbesian state of nature. So a war of all against all, a field of conflict. He, in one place he says, uh, this economic realm is like the remnants of the state of nature. Everyone does what they want, no order and so on. So he doesn't really buy this invisible hand story from Adam Smith. Now, when we look at Jean-Baptiste Tse and David Ricardo, the other two names that Smith mentions, um, there is less to be said here because he really doesn't discuss in any detail their central writings. 
uh, CEL is famous for what is today called SAS law. And here the idea is that supply creates its own demand. So um, if someone starts a company and they start to produce something, then the question is, can they sell these goods to someone who is going to come up with the demand for these new goods? And say had an argument that, OK, these people who start the company, they need to employ others, so they will pay them wages. And then somehow the wages will filter through the economic system. And in the end, there will be enough um, demand for all the new supply. And that's again, in a way, one of these arguments about how markets are self regulating and self stabilizing. And we simply don't find anything like that um, in Hegel's writings. And on the contrary, we do find some hints that he might have been influenced by thinkers who were more critical of um, of Se and who, who pointed out that when not all of this new um, income is used for consumption, if some people hoard it instead, then you won't get this uh, natural or automatic balance of Seth's law. And that's something that you might have gotten from James Stewart, another economist who's mostly forgotten today, who was also much more critical of Seth's law. With regard to Ricardo, um, it's also not clear where exactly Hegel would have taken up arguments from him. Rick Two of the central arguments in Ricardo are about the accumulation of capital and how that is in the long run more or less beneficial um, and about the effects of different kinds of taxes. And I haven't got this on the slides, but one could also mention Ricardo's views about foreign trade, about foreign trade always being beneficial. That's also not Hegel's position at all. So. Hegel says that there are these economic laws, but he doesn't really take up all the arguments that the early economists of his day had made. And when one asks oneself, well, why is this? Why does he say, well, we should look at these thinkers who see some order in this chaos, and at the same time, he doesn't really believe it. I think it's quite helpful to turn to this notion that he uses of economics being a science of the understanding. And of course, there are lots of questions about what Hegel means by understanding. And I won't go into all the details here, but one central point about understanding in contrast to reason is that understanding tends to take certain things as giving and hold certain things fixed, whereas reason is this capacity to challenge everything and to recognize that things are contingent, not to just accept the premises. The kind of understanding that economics as a science uses, I think, is that it leaves certain things fixed and doesn't question them. And one of these things is people's preferences and the, the features of their individual character, their upbringing, their culture that determine what they will actually do when they enter this economic realm. So, so Hegel says all the time, oh, in the economic realm, everyone can do what they want. But he doesn't ask, at, at least not in this part, well, where do these things that people want come from? And that is something that la later economists have also sort of done um, because they've assumed that, well, all people want to better their condition, as Smith um, calls this in one place. Um, or in, in John Stuart Mill, later on, he says, well, we need, can focus on the consequences of the pursuit of wealth. And he just assumes that human beings are pursuing wealth. So we take this as given, and then we try to explore what the consequences are. Um, and modern economic approaches that use rational choice theory do basically the same thing. And in a way, this is a very static picture of what human beings are. We make certain assumptions about human um, nature, and then we hold these fixed, and then we try to figure out what the consequences are. Um, 
And of course, economists always like to say, well, it's just methodological assumptions. But of course, those are very powerful economic assumptions and arguably, but I'm just saying this in brackets here, they also had a sort of perf uh, performative cultural effect on how the economy has then actually functioned. So what does this mean for thinking about markets? When we take human preferences as fixed and we ask, well, how can we tame markets? So the scheme for this can, is on this next slide. So we take human preferences as given. For example, everyone wants to earn more money or everyone wants to minimize their uh, labor time. These are all very basic sort of static assumptions. And then we ask how the rules and incentives of the system can be adapted such that given these human preferences, certain results will come out of it. And I, I put this picture here. I don't know whether you know these kinds of uh, flipper games where you have little balls and then you have uh, a structure around them. And I mean, those are, there are different versions of this, but then you have the laws of gravity and you shoot these little balls up and then they follow the laws of gravity and you can try to um, guide them in a certain direction by using these different levers of the framework. And that's sort of a metaphor for how this perspective on the economic system functions. We assume human beings are like these little balls driven by very simple preferences. They will, we can always predict what they will do. And what matters is that we set the rules and we create that kind of framework that gives us the results that we want. And in Hegel, that's more or less what the police does. So he says the police is the universal which acts with regard to civil society. And it has two tasks. The first is to remo remove contingencies which interfere with this or that end and to uh, uh, attain undisturbed security of persons and property. And then the second aim is to realize the right of individuals to livelihood and welfare, so to fight the extreme forms of poverty. And the measures that the police can take in Hegel include market surveillance, um, the arbitration of disputes, um, oversight of industries, um, and sometimes in extraordinary circumstances, also fixing of prices for the common necessities of life. And I mean, that's more than what many economists in Hegel's time and also today would recommend, but it's the same kind of methodological approach in the sense that you have an external framework of legal rules and measures um, that can sort of guide all these economic forces in a certain direction. And, and Hegel also explicitly calls the police an external order. It doesn't really touch the inner lives of individuals. It doesn't make them think twice about their preferences. It doesn't change them in any way. Um, so if one were to read Hegel only up to that point, one could think that, well, when it comes to the economic realm, he's sort of similar to what modern economists are also doing in terms of their methodology. But that's not all that he does. And I think that's the interesting point about Hegel having the police and the corporations as these two forces that can embed markets. So the second institution that Hegel has in order to tame markets are these corporations. And they, they're apparently some kind of professional associations of those who work in the same craft or in the same branch of some business. But in some places in lecture notes, he actually also talks about local communities as corporations. Um, so it's sort of unclear what they actually are. Um, and he also he, he very clearly says that he was not thinking of the old feudal guilds, which were these uh, associations mostly of, of traders. Um, that were very rigid and mostly defending their own privileges. So he says, no, that's not what I want. But it sort of remains unclear how exactly he imagines these corporations to work. But they do appear in a critical point 
in the architecture of the philosophy of rights. They come at the very end of the section on civil society, just before he makes the transition into the part on the state. So we don't quite know how exactly these institutions are supposed to work, but they come at this really crucial point, so they must have been important for him. And I mean, in the secondary literature, there are lots of suggestions he might have um, thought about institutions that had their origin in Roman law or medieval constitutionalism, but that doesn't actually really help us very much either. The second big puzzle is how these institutions are supposed to coexist with the free market that he talks about just a few paragraphs earlier in the text. Because it seems that he wants a free market with free, more or less free play of the market price and supply and demand for goods and services. But the corporations are sort of regulating the supply side, so the, the production side. Um, and it's not quite clear um, how this can work. So for example, if you have a corporation of, let's say, shoemakers, and then another individual comes in and also wants to offer shoes in the market, who's going to win in the competition? Or is the corporation going to somehow adopt this new member? Is it going to be a mandatory membership in the corporation? But then what if, I don't know, we have the corporation of uh, in some, some, some industry where people just don't want the product anymore. Um, and then what are these people supposed to do? Are they supposed to all jointly switch to a different um, industry? Or how is this is all completely unclear how, how this is supposed to work. Um, but I think that for Hegel, the corporations have a really interesting function, even though there are all these um, unclear elements, because they start opening up what remained fixed in the earlier discussions, namely the formation of human preferences. Um, and preferences are, of course, coming out of people's general character or how they are formed. And you may know this um, infamous German term Bildung, um, which is at the same time sort of an ideal of education. You want to be a gebildet person, so someone who's well formed, but it also has a much more basic sort of biological um, meaning. So you could think about how a, a tree forms uh, blossoms and then fruits, and that, that would also be described as a kind of building. So, that's a notion that has sort of Aristotelian roots and that Hegel and other uh, German idealists have used quite a lot. And I think the corporations are one of the places in Hegel's kind of civil society where Bildung takes place. Not the only one, but an important one. Um, Hegel emphasizes that in modern societies, people's preferences are not based on biological necessities alone. Um, those would in fact be fixed. You know, if it's just about getting a certain amount of calories to every human being, we have, you know, medical science and we can give a pretty clear answer to that. But that's not how modern markets work. People want certain kinds of foods um, at certain times, prepared in a certain way. And Hegel is quite explicit that this is really different from the way in which animal preferences function. This is a specifically human thing, that our biological necessities are shaped into these various cultural forms. And he is also sort of positive about this, and he doesn't condemn it. He's, he's not a Rousseauian in, in, in this sense. Um, and so he's totally open and apparently doesn't care about the fact that humans get their ideas about what they want from their social environment. They see that someone else has something, they want the same thing. Um, so imitation is an important part of what happens in civil society. Um, and people also just adapt to the social traditions around themselves in questions of dress or he says times of meals, all these things, there are these conventions. And yeah, that's, that's how we human beings function. Um, so that's 
a typically sociological perspective, if you like, because it really asks where people's preferences come from and where in the social context these influences act on individuals. Um, there, there's a uh, sort of a quip that economics is the science of how people choose and sociology is about why they have no choice because their social context um, determines what they actually want or what they will choose. Um, and in that sense, Hegel is really taking a sociological perspective because he really asks, well, how is it that people have all these different preferences? And by the way, the, the, the corporations here function together with the different classes that he describes. So he says, People who work in agriculture as a class, they have a specific character, they have specific preferences uh, and so on. And the same for those who work in trade or in uh, civil servants and so on. So he assumes that what people do and the kind of people that they cooperate with on a daily basis, um, that's how their character gets formed. Um, and he is quite explicit that we need these kinds of communities. And I'll show you a quote now, what he says about a person who is not a member of such a corporation or yeah, social class, whatever, one of these communities. So he says, unless he is a member of an authorized corporation, an individual is without rank or dignity. His isolation reduces his business to mere self-seeking, and his livelihood and satisfaction become insecure. Consequently, he has to try to gain recognition for himself by giving external proofs of success in his business, and to these proofs, no limits can be set. And for anyone who knows a little bit about Hegel, if there can be no limits, that's a problem for him, because in his uh, way of thinking, there always needs to be limits to something um, and, and, and if there's something completely unlimited that uh, sort of explodes out of his system. So that's a sort of warning sign that there's something dangerous going on here. And in fact, commentators have taken up this passage and have argued that um, if someone is not a member of a corporation, then people will have an unlimited desire for ever more goods because they don't get recognition and they have no sense of an appropriate level of consumption and that's why they become these greedy individualistic strivers for ever more gain which economists assume is what all human beings are like so hegel is sort of saying that's a pathological case of someone who's not a member of a corporation it's not the normal case um, so what Hegel here looks at is really the question, how are people formed in the social context in which they live? And also what kinds of solidarity do we see in these social contexts? He says about the corporations that they also have various, various support functions for individuals. So people care for each other in these corporations. And if someone falls into misery, for example, because some family member dies or something, then the others will take care of that person. So there's a sense of, um, if you like, a sort of proto-social insurance here as well. And that educates the members of the corporation in a kind of ethos of solidarity which is different from the ethos of the state, but which is sort of preparing them by, you know, being socialized in this more limited community where they can see all the others, can probably, you know, interact with them on a regular basis. That already changes them and they are not these egoistic self-seeking creatures anymore. And that also explains why the corporations are in this position in the philosophy of right. That makes for the ideal transition towards the political state, where it's really about um, individuals as citoyens and not just as bourgeois. So really as, as a citizen in the sense of proud member of the political state. So where does this leave us if you take these two perspectives that Hegel describes in the police and the corporations? Um, these two 
models are really two very different ways of thinking about how this play of forces in the free market can be tamed and embedded. The police model is the, the model that modern economics is also using. Change the incentive structures. Don't ask where people's preferences come from. Change what they have to pay for what, basically. So, for example, um, one um, approach um, to, uh, to, to environmental ethics is to say, well, let's just make CO2 emissions super expensive because then people will react to it. Then when they have to pay for it, they will adapt their behavior. Don't preach to them, just put a price on it. That, that would be a typical response from that kind of model. And I, I think in the case of environmental ethics and CO2 emissions, <laughs> there's actually a lot to be said in favor of, of that approach if you make it a really high price. Um, but it's one way of how to think about embed markets. It's not the only one. And in the contemporary or sort of 90s and 2000s debate about economic ethics in the German context, it's quite interesting that there is one school of thinkers, um, Karl Hohmann was the, the first and there are a number of others, who really said, well, if you want to think about economic ethics, that's the approach we have to take. We have to create a better framework for markets. And he was very much in, uh, influenced by institutional economics. And it's this picture of the police. The police has to set the framework such that what people do, what their preferences lead them to do, will lead to the right results. And then there is the other model of the corporations, um, where it's not about changing the framework, but if you like changing people, changing their preferences, their behavior. Um, and in economic ethics, there is a competing school, um, Peter Ulrich was, was the main thinker here and a few others, who said, well, that's how we have to think about embedding markets. Don't just change the framework, actually create people with better preferences, convince them, have arguments with them. And he, he was very much influenced by um, Habermas and, and discourse ethics and the idea that you can really convince people through different arguments and make them see new perspectives. And he emphasized what is called in business ethics the stakeholder approach to have dialogues between different stakeholders of a company. Don't just go for what maximizes profits, but talk to each other, find solutions, change uh, people's um, preferences and approaches to how they want to do business. The thing is that in Hegel, these two models are sort of apparently on the same level. He doesn't really say one is more important than the other. And of course, there's still the political state above everything. But he seems to have been clear that both approaches can play an important role for making sure that this chaotic play of forces in the market doesn't disrupt society too much. But if you look at uh, today's perception of the history of ideas, there is quite an asymmetry here. Because whenever one talks about embedding markets, people often instinctively think about the sort of Smithian approach, the economic approach, that you need external regulation of markets, if, if, if people want to regulate markets at all. I mean, something they are indeed uh, self-regulating, I think that's an untenable position, but then the next best alternative for many is just to focus on external regulation. And it is, in a way, a misreading of Smith for reasons that I can't discuss here. Um, it's, a, it's a super simplistic picture, which often ends up being a kind of market absolutism, saying, well, all these human interventions are actually not a good idea. Let's just let markets do the work. And then the assumption is that somehow there will be good outcomes, which I think is really, really dangerous uh, and pretty misguided. Um, but I don't. I think I have to um, say more about this here. The question is whether, in addition to these external forms of regulating markets, we could also revive the kind of approach that is embedded in Hegel's picture of the corporations, which is focusing on the ethos and the sense of solidarity that can be created in certain institutions. Um, and one interesting question is, of course, what is the role of workplaces? So if one agrees that in Hegel, the corporations are in some way about the workplace, then the question from a modern perspective becomes, well, do workplaces pe prepare people for 
some kind of, today we would say democratic citizenship, or do they teach them habits of submission or manipulation or whatever? And I mean, I mentioned this a little bit earlier. For me, the next question then is, well, how do we actually organize the workplaces that are the modern forms of the corporations? But in any case, the interesting lesson that we can here take from Hegel is to not only ask about the external regulation, but also ask, where do people's preferences actually come from and how are they shaped by the institutions in which they work and which they encounter others in the economy. So I'll stop here and I'll also stop um, sharing my screen um, and I very much look forward to the discussion with you. You're still muted. Yeah. I think you're still muted. OK, now it's it's working. Yeah. Okay. It happens. Uh, OK, so uh, as I was saying, um, we would like to thank you very much for your excellent exposition and uh, to say again that it's a great pleasure uh, having you here with us today. Uh, I'd like to formulate one or two questions to open uh, the debate and afterwards we can uh, we can go to the questions of our attendees and uh, of our colleagues here. Uh, from the organizing committee. We have uh, already a reaction on the chat. Uh, uh, Jessica, the participant Jessica, is asking if you could make the, uh, the material of the presentation, this PowerPoint presentation, somehow available uh, to, the, to the attendees. Yeah, I think she, that, that shouldn't be a problem. I think I sent you a version so you can feel free to make it available. Yeah. Okay. So I ask the ones that are interested in uh, having this uh, presentation material, you can uh, just let your email address on the chat and then I can forward the PowerPoint presentation for, for the ones who are interested. So uh, as I say, I'd like to formulate um, one or two questions, uh, initial questions. Uh, you made it very clear in your exposition that uh, in Hegel's exam of this economic aspects of the civil society, he uh, kind of refuses a merely economic view of the market, which, as you said, is still very modern nowadays, and uh, which considers individual preferences as given, only uh, influenced by a change in its institutional framework or the external order, as you uh, as you named it. Uh, in Hegel, he wants uh, to emphasize the fact that people's choices are actually formed by their social context, or uh, he argues that the corporation would shape these uh, individuals in a more uh, complete way. Uh, and hence, these institutions uh, would be uh, crucial for the formation, for this building of the individual's preferences and identities, and uh, very important uh, to Hegel for the development of an ethos that brings orders into civil society, brings order into civil society, and also secures the full ethos of uh, the ulterior political citizenship. So, uh, uh, you asked uh, the question at the end of your presentation whether an economic ethos and the institutions that nurture it, whether it could be revived. And uh, my first question goes in this direction. Uh, I'd like to know uh, nowadays which institutions you think could play the role assumed by Hegel's corporations. Um, and uh, if uh, it makes sense to say that our would, uh, there would exist institutions or initiatives which would represent at least these aspirations held by Hegel. And when I raise this question, I have uh, particularly in mind uh, nowadays initiatives such as the manifest democratizing work 
published in the beginning of the pandemic. So maybe this is something you uh, you would be able to explore in your comment, telling us uh, whether, in your opinion, Hegel's ethical demands would have any common points with this kind of contemporary initiatives uh, of civil society. And the second question, uh, exploring more specifically the relationship between Hegel and Marx, uh, I'd like to know uh, from your point of view, how valid or how up to date would be Hegel's proposal uh, regarding the challenges and the contradictions of uh, capitalism and brought by capitalism, uh, especially after Marx uh, defends the thesis that we cannot expect to get rid of the uh, of uh, capitalism contradictions simply through the intervention of institutions supposed to tame to tame the market. Uh, so my second question would be. Would Hegel's demand in strengthen certain institutions in civil society be enough to get rid of the most fundamental capitalism contradictions that lead to consequences such as poverty, as unemployment, precarious conditions of work, natural environment destruction, etc. So this would be uh, my two initial questions. Thank you. Those are huge questions, of course. Um, do stop me if I'm going on for too long here. I'll start with the second one. Um, so on a Marxian picture, you could say that all this talk about the police and the corporation and then the political state in Hegel somehow taming or superseding markets, that just misguided ideology because this, all these political structures are just instruments in the hands of the capital owners. And therefore, they would never really tame markets. They would always do what capitalists want. And in that sense, there is no counterforce here. And uh, I mean, of course, <laughs> one could now distinguish between earlier Marx and later Marx and, and, and different readings, but um, I'll just take this as the basic picture here. And I think um, in a way, um, Hegel's picture that it is possible to politically tame markets has proven partly correct, but only partly. And by partly correct, I mean that historically, especially in the late last third of the 19th century and um, then again after World War II in some countries, there were quite successful models of embedding markets in political structures. Um, where you did actually get a very generous for the time welfare state, where you did get um, labor law, um, occupational uh, insurance, all these things that social democracy has fought for. Um, so I think there were certain periods where the Hegelian picture was sort of plausible and the Marxian picture, the Marxist picture that the state is really just in the hands of the of the capital ownership um, that didn't seem correct because there really did seem to be that counter movement where the labor movement, the unions, the social socialist, the social democratic parties had this sort of political momentum to really embed markets. The question is whether that's still the case today or whether it was always an illusion. Some people think, and I, I have certain sympathies for that perspective, that the fact that this kind of taming was possible had to do with the conflict between the two big systems, capitalism and socialism, because capitalists were basically afraid that if they didn't make certain concessions, then there might be a revolution and the countries would go into socialism. And so they, the fact that you did have a, a socialist bloc uh, had a sort of uh, dampening effect on the power of capitalists. In today's situation, I think it has become much more difficult. There is no real sort of external alternative to, to capitalism. And the problem is that we have a globalized economy and most political movements are still taking place on national or maybe sort of supranational but limited um, levels. Um, and that makes it extremely difficult to tame markets in any way. I don't think that it's a hopeless 
because um, I think there are certain signs of hope because there is really, or at least that's my perception, I'd be interested to hear your perception, but my perception is that people really don't believe in the neoliberal story any longer. So there is a search for alternative models. And the question is whether there could be new political coalitions that could form, that would revive these yeah, progressive coalitions that were really putting markets in their place and, and putting strong institutions in place that would actually supersede markets. Um, so that's that's what I'm currently wondering. And I think, you know, it's, it's an open question, but, you know, what's the alternative to trying and, and, and trying to um, get this going? And I think in a way, you know, those who are who think that we should really get out of capitalism um, would could still form allies for those who want to radically, you know, reduce the scope of capitalism. So I think in the current situation, there could be a really broad political coalition on the left, if only the left didn't fall into infighting so often, um, to push back against um, this kind of market absolutism that is just, you know, an ideology of, 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 of the capitalist system, really. So that that's my current position in a nutshell and as I said I'd be very interested to, to hear your positions. Now on the other question, could there be institutions that take the role of the Hegelian corporations? I think definitely not what you could call corporations these days, i.e. international or transnational big companies whose basic aim is to exploit workers. I mean that, that I should have said this actually earlier. Um, what he means by corporations is not corporations in the sense of, I don't know, Google or Walmart or something like that. Um, I think that probably what the different functions of the corporations that he imagines are distributed to in, onto different institutions. And it's also probably a bit different in different countries these days. So, for example, the social insurance function in at least some countries, there is still some you know, government organized social welfare system, not as generous as we would like it to be, but there is some kind of safety net that's not done through the companies that people work for. Um, but that doesn't have to be a huge problem if the other functions are then done by, by other institutions. I think that if workplaces were more democratic, they could to some extent be these kinds of associations where people learn a certain ethos, um, see that they don't have to strive for endless material goods um, and receive some kind of building. I, I have a hard time imagining that when uh, workplaces are completely hierarchical um, with no opportunity for workers' voice because these kinds of communities require openness and, and, and opportunities for people to to engage and dialogue with others because how would your preferences change if you can't you know exchange arguments with others it, i don't think it can be just by watching what others do and sort of blindly imitating what they do so and, and that also um draws a connection to the the work uh democratizing work manifesto because i think um this was um I mean, it didn't mention Hegel or anything, but there is really a sense there that in order to re-embed capitalism and these global markets, we need to decommodify work and we need to keep economic power in corporations in democratic check. And I mean, maybe your question was also on the level of the kinds of, you know, the kind of movement, maybe, maybe movement is too much, but the kind of solidarity, let's say, among all the signatories of this um, uh, manifesto. I mean, if you think about this as kind of some kind of civil society activity, I think that civil society organizations can also be these kinds of spaces where people's character is formed, where they meet like-minded people, um, their preferences are shaped and so on. So civil society is another important factor, I think. Um, the problem, and that, that's the last point I want to make here, the problem with civil society organizations is I think that that's only a model that works for people who have the time and the energy to actually participate in these kinds of initiatives. Um, but uh, in, in many countries, you know, the less privileged have to work two or three jobs just to survive, and then they don't have time to, you know, go to meetings. And 
or, or participate in, in civil society organizations in other forms. And that's why I think that the focus on the workplace is so important because people are in their workplaces anyway and they will be shaped by them. And if they are shaped in negative ways, that's a problem for democracy. But if they could be you know, shaped there in positive ways, learning to be good Democrats in their workplace, that could be a huge push for political democracy as well. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Thank you very much for your reactions. We have uh, also uh, questions from the chat and uh, from someone who unfortunately didn't put uh, his, uh, his name or her name. Uh, the question is uh, as follow, what are your position regarding the Marxist critique of this rehabilitation of an economic ethos of capitalism by authors like Honet or Yegi? Yeah, so if I understood it correctly, the question is the, my position on the Marxist critique of these yeah, commentators who take up the Hegelian model. So, uh, and that of course means that it depends on how you read all the different people in, in the chain of argument. Um, so uh, let, let me maybe say something about Honet um, first, because I, I know this a bit better than Rahelsberg. Um, so, I mean, if I take um, especially Freedom's Right, so, so Honet's big book in which he sort of follows the structure of the philosophy of right, at least roughly, he has a picture there where he assumes that the economic realm can be one of um, positive social freedom in which we mutually reinforce one another in our freedom. So person A has a certain goal and then person B supports person A in pursuing the goal. I mean, it's, it's a sort of very harmonic story in which everyone can live with others peacefully. And that's something that I'm sort of skeptical about in Honet. Now, I don't know whether that's the kind of Marxist critique that this person who asked the question meant here. I think that the economic realm is one in which we see conflicts of interest, we see stronger and weaker positions. And unless we have very strict regulation from the outside, but then potentially also through some kind of, you know, ethos on these two Hegelian models. Um, I don't think the economic realm is going to be that kind of harmonic sphere very easily. I think it takes very, you know, strict regulation, maybe no market relations in certain areas that are today, you know, submitted to markets at all. I think, for example, healthcare and education should not be governed by market forces at all. And I think it takes a lot of political effort and a sort of constant, um, yeah, how you say, constant consciousness and alertness, because in the economic realm, there will be conflicts. And I think Hegel was totally right about this. And uh, Honneth's picture for me is sort of too optimistic that all these conflicts will be solved on their own. So that that's something where, where I, I, I don't quite share his optimism that it's all about social freedom sort of happening all on its own. And I mean, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure what kind of Marxist criticism of Rahel Yegi's work, the person who asked the question he was thinking about, but I mean, this account of critiques of life world, there, there's a sort of, I mean, uh, there, there are many very interesting aspects there, but there's a sort of a similar lack of attention to the really hard fights and clashes that can also happen. I mean, it sounds more like, okay, we live in these different life worlds and can we critique them and can people accept these critiques? So, so it's again, it's a very sort of discursive picture. It's all about arguments that people exchange. And in, in I mean, it wants to be a political um, account, of course, but the aspect of politics that is really about conflicts, about, okay, if capital gets more, labor gets less, and we need to find 
a way of making sure that capital gets less in labor gets more. That kind of very basic, you know, kind of struggle that seems to be a bit missing. But I, I, I'm not sure whether Rahal would accept my characterization. And I know that she's very interested in democratizing uh, work as well. So maybe um, this is something she would actually accept and just say that, OK, in that book, I didn't focus so much on that. I, I, I I can ask her maybe next time I see her, but I think one needs to be really aware that, you know, you don't get the kind of modern economic system that can be potentially quite productive without conflicts. And unless you have really strict regulation, those conflicts are going to be at the cost of the weaker parties. And, and that's what's so problematic about it. Thank you, Lisa. Ricardo, uh, also would like to ask a question. Ricardo, you are on mute. You need to enable your microphone also. We have our difficulties with technology. <laughs> yeah, now it's great. Perfect. You're still muted. Mute again. I'm sorry. I don't know. I think it's a Teams issue. You are on mute. You need to enable your microphone. Oh, now yeah. it's okay. No. No, no, no. Now, yeah. now yeah. you are hearing me. Yes. So sorry, sure. I, I was just explaining that I have two screens and I have um, always difficult to find where my my um, uh, my my cursor is so um thank you very much lisa for uh, your very interesting presentation i have actually uh, a question that i think um dialogues with this last one so uh, let me put this way um i don't i i'm not quite um uh convinced that um, Hornet uh, does uh, have an harmonic view of the market. I mean, uh, if he uh, pretends that um, or um, or um, uh, have the uh, the assumption that the market has a normative principle that is um, important for uh, one's self-realization, one's social freedom. Uh, do, uh, I don't think that this premise implies that uh, you are uh, assuming a market without conflict, uh, are harmonious. So, uh, I mean, uh, couldn't we, uh, in a certain way, um uh, agree with Honet uh, that there is a normative principle in the market or you wouldn't accept it. You would say that a uh, market is uh, something that we only have the option of taming it, but externally, uh, I mean, even in this model of the corporation, what is the principle of this formation of the cooperation? It is internal of the market. So does the market has a normative principle for you or not? That, that's the question to, to sum it up. Yeah, thank you very thank much. You. Um, yes and no. And let me try to, to explain um, how I see this here. So what Hana focuses on is this possibility of mutually sort of reinforcing uh, sets of interests. I mean, it's, it's this idea, OK, I don't know, you produce shoes, I produce cheese, you need cheese, I need shoes, we swap. Nice. I mean, that, that's one aspect of markets. The thing is, you are not the only shoemaker, I'm not the only cheese maker. There's competition. And competition is the sort of dark side of markets, which Hegel was very much aware of. But if you want to give people certain freedoms, for example, the freedom to choose their profession, to choose to be a shoemaker or a cheesemaker or whatever, then competition 
it's sort of unavoidable. I mean, it's a little bit like, um, this is not quite an appropriate example, but I'll, I'll, I'll just make the analogy and you'll see why there are still differences. If you want people to have the freedom to marry whom they like, there might be very unhappy people who lose out because the, they don't get the marriage partner that they want. And a little bit, I mean, the, of course, this is more complicated, but it's a little bit like this in markets in the sense that when you have these happy meetings between the shoemaker and the cheesemaker, there are all the other shoemakers and cheesemakers that might lose out. And the story that Adam Smith tell and the economists tell is that, well, it is because of the competition that markets are so efficient because the shoemaker really has to try very hard to be the best shoemaker and the cheesemaker the same. And then the other side gets uh, a good offer. So it's sort of the, 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 the normative principle that there should be mutually beneficial exchanges. That's nice, but it comes hand in hand with the problem of competition. And competition needs to be reined in because otherwise it drives people to potentially very immoral um, strategies. And I mean, we, we know all about, you know, pollution and, um, you know, harming competitors and so on. So I think um, unless by markets you mean something that doesn't have competition, but that, that would be a strange use of the word, wouldn't it? I mean, usually when we say markets, there is some element of competition there. And that's, I think, where this conflict element and this element of, you know, potentially sliding down into problematic practices, that needs a lot of regulation. Because otherwise, you don't get the space for the, you know, for these few happy encounters to take place at all. Does that, that sort of answer your question? Yes, yes. Uh, actually, um, the, the only point that um, 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 for me was um, not complained in, in the uh, not not contained, sorry, in the uh, the answer is uh, the um, the performance principle. I mean, the uh, Lyston's principle. Uh, uh, Honeth argues that in market you have this performance principle and for uh, that reason you could see a um, certain normativity in uh, the market so at least is that the it, that is the way that i, I read on it i i don't know uh, uh, do you let's say by this performance principle uh, do you think that that's reasonable to think that you can have a, 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 um, a, a principle of a social freedom um, building on this this principle, this performance principle. That, that's the point. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I I, I, I should go back and and, and reread Hegel's um, uh, Honnets, probably also Hegel's, but Honnets uh, text to see how exactly he connects. The, the achievement principle and social freedom. I, I always saw the point about social freedom as central for his account of markets, not so much the achievement principle. And maybe I read him in that way because I do not at all buy the achievement principle in a sense, because I think real life, I mean, as a normative ideal, it's either empty or unachievable. It's empty because in a way, very often it, it sort of that's not what Holland wants, but often it gets turned into whoever wins deserves to win. And that's not true because the, con the starting conditions are often very unfair. Um, and, and, and also on the way, I mean, there are all the discrimination that minorities and women and so on face, for example. That's just sort of, it's, it's very dangerous to say the successful ones somehow have, a, you know, achieved something and that's why they deserve to win. Or it's, it's, it's sort of an empty ideal because if you start to actually think about, okay, what is it that they achieve? Um, and is that really something that they ha can be held responsible for? Then you come, okay, they, they somehow worked hard, but that's because they were brought up by parents who told them to work hard. They can't be responsible for that. They, they really made an effort. Well, but so if you start really thinking about, okay, what is it that people can be held responsible for? I think in the end, if you really go down all the arguments, 
very, very little, rem if anything at all, remains. Because in a way, um, we are really sort of, it, it's our circumstances that influence to a great extent to, yeah, to, to how much we are able to play by the rules of the game. Now, having said this, I think there is one sense in which one can make sense of this achievement principle, but that's a very sort of reduced and pragmatic sense, and that has nothing at all to do with sort of deep moral principles. And that's something like, okay, you have a position for a surgeon in a hospital and you want to fill it and you have five applicants and you want the applicant who has the best skills as a surgeon to fill that role. So they, I think there can be sort of a functional understanding of achievement, where, which is both backwards looking, but also sort of forward looking. If, you know, if you, if you have so a candidate who was a great surgeon in the past, but for some reason we know he will be, not be a good surgeon in the future, that person shouldn't get the job. So, so I think we can, within institutions that are meaningful and that have a point and so on, we can, and, and I'm assuming that hospitals, you know, have a point and that the role of the surgeon has a point, we can then tell a story about why it's reasonable and it can be justified to choose the candidate who ha is the best fit for the position. But I would not at all see this as a kind of deep sort of normative basic principle of our societies. I think it has been totally overblown. It has sometimes been used to justify inequalities in a way that I find completely indefensible. And that's why I'm very skeptical about this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, I'd like to forward you a question uh, that was made on the chat by Gustavo Cunha. It's a very interesting question, but it's a very long one too. So I'd like to, uh, I recommend you to read it, uh, the written question while I read it aloud, if you can uh, just follow it uh, on the chat. It's Gustavo Cunha uh, from UFSC, Universidade Federal de Santa Catarina. So uh, his question, uh, he thanks you for the very interesting talk and he says regarding uh, what you call the sociological perspective on Hegel and the need of, for corporations uh, as a sort of boundary for the individual search for recognition, it still leaves open the question of why does solidarity ties people together beyond the workplace? As you actually very well know, Durkheim's argument for organic solidarity deals precisely with this social or sociological dimension. But for him, corporations are the medium through, through which organic solidarity appears as a normative horizon of interdependence and mutual acknowledgement. Do you see it somehow connected to Hegel's sociological insights and how? So this is the first questions. There are two more in the same uh, comment. So the second one would be, and how do you see it if you do? Uh, how do you see a possible connection with a search for recognition within the division of labor? And finally, a non-related question to those above uh, in a political economic context where many of us see that we need, we need, we do need to save the world of labor. Uh, how should neoliberal forms of deregulation and atomization be challenged if work itself has become so individualized through digital platforms and so on? That's that's the the three questions. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Gustavo. Um, those are excellent question so I'll try to cover these various aspects and I I think I should anticipate that I I keep thinking about that last question and it bugs me and I wish I had a good answer but I'll, I'll, I'll get to that so um, yes so in Hegel the, the corporations are not as such the institutions that create solidarity between all members of society. I agree with that. And I think that's why they are in this particular place in the philosophy of right, where the transition is then made to the political state. And actually it's quite interesting that in the later part in the, in, in, in the part on the state, 
when he talks about political representation, I mean, he's not a Democrat and only has a monarch, but he has an understanding of the corporations also being part of the political representation of individuals. So the way he seems to imagine this is that somehow through the corporation, people are then tied into these wider spheres of solidarity in the political realm. Um, and I mean, he has these other, uh, yeah, from today's perspective, somewhat problematic views about how, you know, war is an opportunity for people to feel solidarity with all their fellow citizens. Um, and this is then all taking place in the political realm and, and the corporations can't do that. Now, if you want to connect this to, to Durkheim, and I mean, um, Durkheim has this notion of organic solidarity, which arises between people who actually do different things, but who can see each other as sort of complementary. And I think in a way that's sort of a different picture than the Hegelian one, because the Hegelian one, if you look at the corporations, that's people who do similar things together, who are, you know, sort of forming what in Durkheim would be mechanic solidarity, solidarity because of similar experiences, similarity in, in outlook, activities, and so on. So the kind of solidarity that Durkheim calls organic, which happens between different people doing different things, that would be kind of the solidarity between the cheesemaker and the shoemaker who see, oh, we can actually be useful to each other. And so I think that if one wants to try to combine these two pictures, you have the Hegelian kind of solidarity among colleagues, as it were. And then whenever someone from the corporation is in touch with someone outside, for example, a supplier. So the shoemaker's corporation needs to buy input, I don't know, leather or whatever. Or maybe they can make vegan shoes, I don't know. Um, that, or when they then sell the shoes to their customers, that's when this other kind of solidarity that recognizes, oh, you're doing something different. But we are actually mutually um, not only compatible, but um, mutually sort of um, we can support each other. That's when that kind of solidarity, um, I think, then has its place. And I mean, as, as, I, as I wrote in the one paper on Durkheim, so a, a, a little noted dimension of Durkheim's notion of solidarity is that he says this can only happen if inequality in society is kept under control, because if there's too much inequality, then all these relationships between different people will be marred by inequalities of power and dependence. And then people don't see this as a question of mutuality any longer. Then it's just about pressure. And I mean, you could also well, say something about competition here and so on. But basically, inequality disturbs this picture that different people can see their complementarities and the solidarity can cry out of that. So, so that that's how I would see these um, two forms of solidarity here hanging together. Um, and now, then the last question: um, digital work. Now, um, we had a conference last year when there were, could still be conferences in, in person, and it was on solidarity at work. And it so happened; it was just a coincidence that we had two papers behind each other, which really for me, made this problem very vivid. So one was about 19th century miners in a mining region. I think it was a comparison between the France and German situation, but actually pretty similar. These people live in the same place, then they go to work together. They have a common enemy, their employer. They have the same shared experiences. They share their free time activities. It was all, a lot about football and how football was important for these people and they share a lifestyle. And so in a way, it's very easy to imagine how these people would start to join forces, organize themselves and start a struggle for better labor conditions. Because there are all these factors of shared experience, shared spaces um, and so on. And then the next paper after that paper was on freelance translators it was a Polish case study who have Facebook groups where they support each other. And the researcher who did this was doing a sort of ethnographic study and she also called it solidarity, but it was obviously a very different kind of solidarity. It was these freelancers who sometimes also competed for jobs, but I mean, apparently they were doing pretty specialized translations. So, so they were on the privileged end, let's say. They would set, 
you know, ask questions on a Facebook group, like how do you translate this very specific term or, oh gosh, I have to finish something by midnight, send some good wishes, send some good wipes, these kinds of posts that are you know, very typical for social media. And then others would respond and it was all very friendly and cheerful, but it was not at all the kind of shared experience out of which you'd expect a political struggle to happen. And I think that that's really one of the big challenges. And I think, I mean, if, if there's going to be more home office during and maybe after Corona, there, there's also a huge question, where can people encounter each other and build the kinds of relationship of trust that would then enable them to take risks together. Because, you know, struggling for, for labor rights is always taking risks. And, you know, if there are only three people joining, then three, three people are likely to be just dismissed or silenced, then everyone else will just continue as before. So you need these ties of solidarity and trust. And I really wonder how they can be built when so much communication is just taking place online. I don't think it's impossible, but I think one really needs to think very hard about new strategies. I, I've seen various ethnographic studies about platform work. Um, and I think on a political level, one really needs something like a right to a physical workplace, not in order to just be there, but to meet colleagues in person. Because otherwise, the employers can really have a very effective divide ad impera strategy you know, just keep everyone in their home office. They will never beat each other. They will never gather to, you know, fight for something together. So I think that is a real challenge that you need to take seriously. Um, fortunately, not all workplaces are completely digital. And maybe those in less digitalized workplaces can also, you know, try to be supportive of some others. But I think it's, it's, a, it's a huge challenge. I, I, yeah, I wish I had better answers, but uh, at this point, I'm still struggling with this question. Thank you, Lisa. I will hand over to uh, Manu, Emanuel Nakamura, who also would like to ask you a question. Um, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I would like to, to read um, um, something from your paper. Um, um, just a moment. Um, Hegel um, paid 153, uh, 154. Um, Hegel shows a clear sense of the degree to which individuals are influenced by their social background, arguing that the different social classes all have a specific um, char character. The member of the agricultural class, um, although not, not uh, untouched by modern development, such as the introduction of civil law, are shaped by their mode of subsistence and develop the substantial disposition of an immediate ethical life based on, on the family relationship and on trust. Um, I was um, reading a few weeks ago, um, um, maybe you know the, the book from Melinda Cooper's um, Family Values. And in this book, um, she describes the alliance between um, the uh, neoliberalism and the conservative thought, um, and how um, 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 this alliance um, replaced the, the welfare social institutions with protections based on family relationships. Um, so my question, um, do you think it is possible to find elements in Hegel's philosophy of right to criticize this conservative neoliberal alliance? Or do you think that um, Hegel's social theory is in this regard um, so that Hegel's social theory can no longer be actualized. Yeah, thank you. That, yes. That's an interesting 
connection. Um, I mean, in, in, in a way, Hegel is extremely traditionalist here, and he's sort of, you know, derisive. Oh, these, you know, <laughs> these peasants, they don't want to live up to modern reason, they just stay embedded, there's no awakening of, sub of subjectivity in this realm. Um, and I always felt that this is sort of a more difficult part from a modern perspective in Hegel. What do we do with this claim that there are all these people and Oh, somehow they don't want to be modern, something like that. It sounds sort of very dismissive. Um, but what is, of course, um, you know, a, a correct sociological observation that we can probably still take from him, and is, you know, not all social milieus are open to the same extent to the kinds of, you know, modernness or yeah, he would say reasonable, but this term is of course super loaded, but sort of to the kinds of arguments about individual freedom, the modern state, um, the superseding of family relations. And maybe, you know, we moderns have been a little bit too quick to assume that everyone wants to be modern, everyone wants to be individualistic, um, forgetting that, okay, there might, for whatever reason, and, that the, the separate question then, but there might be parts of the population that might actually, sh you know, not share the set of values. And I don't think we can find in Hegel any mm. kind of account of how these people would then have a coalition. I mean, one could maybe, you know, make a come up with an argument, but I'm not sure it would really hold up to say, OK, the rural classes, they are, of course, also sort of accepting the feudal lords and sort of the, the very unequal, inegalitarian, unfree relations of um, rural life as Hegel imagined it. And so in that sense, there is a connection to what we today would describe as sort of capitalists who are basically acting in a sort of feudal way because they are taking what should be public power, and it becomes a form of private power. So maybe one could say that Hegel also, uh, in his description of the of the agricultural class, sort of suggests that they don't really um, take on all the institutions of the modern state. For example, it's, it's as as you said, it's all based on family relations. Um, it's it's not accepting many of the modern institutions of the state and so on, but I, I mean that the, there are two hundred years of intellectual history since then, and I think what's so distinctively neoliberal today, that's something I'm not sure he could really imagine that kind of complete you know market freedom. I mean he he had read about Smith and Ricardo, but whenever he talks about to this idea that you should let everything free, he immediately says, oh, well, this can't go, go well, don't, don't do this. So I think he was also, I mean, if you think about his, his own experiences, he was still very much experiencing a kind of market that was already doing some of its, you know, problematic work, but that was not the kind of absolutized, complete vision of everything being a market that the neoliberalism in the, in the modern form has. Um, I think, I mean, if, if you want to ask what can we take from Hegel in that respect, I mean, maybe, you know, the notion of Bildung could be one starting point in the sense that democratic citizens need to be formed and, and you know, brought up and, and, and build the kind of uh, democratic character um, that he imagined for the other classes for, I mean, he's sort of, yeah, he's, he's, he was the son of a civil servant and sometimes I think it shows a little bit. He's just full of praise for civil servants and doesn't see that they might also, you know, become quite bureaucratic or technocratic. He, he thinks civil servants embody reason. But what, what matters for him is that um, these people accept the principle of the modern state, the various freedoms that come with it and, and sort of act on its principles in their various roles in the different social spheres. And that presupposes certain attitudes um, and a certain degree of education. And if large parts of the population don't get that kind of education, then we shouldn't be surprised that they don't share the principles of the Hegelian modern state or of 
you know, certain, you know, progressive principles. And then the alternative is that you fall back into other patterns of, um, you know, family ties or whatever. And of course, it's a catastrophe from the perspective of subjective freedom, if you want to use the Hegelian term, especially, of course, for, for women, because the traditional family role is then, you know, <laughs> Hegel wasn't better on that. But you know, if you want to be a modern Hegelian, you can, I think, be a gender egalitarian Hegelian. Um, but what these people today are doing is sort of falling back into gender stereotypes as Hegel saw them in his time. And that's a very, you know, dangerous alliance, I think. So, yeah, I'm not sure how much we can get really out of Hegel, but the, the, the focus on building and the question of how this could be achieved could be one starting point, I think. But do you have other suggestions for what you would want to take from Hegel there? Um, no, I think it is, um, yes, it is a, a difficult point to, um, um, I mean, um, 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 I just thought it was very interesting how um, Melinda Cooper's um, um, shows this alliance between um, um, mark uh, neoliberal market relationships and families and 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 it is all different from what Hegel uh, yeah. see all as family values in yeah, the yeah. philosophy of right and um, I, I, I was uh, co-teaching or lock the other day and uh, if you read the, the second treatise the first chapters that's sort of the vision that you get. I, I mean, I haven't read the Cooper book, but um, I've heard a little bit about it. I, I mean, the Lockean vision, the part of familias, so the household is the unit and the father is the little king and the citizens are sort of equal, but in the family, it's strictly hierarchical. And that combined with a rejection of any state regulation and the idea that, uh, yeah, the market forms sort of naturally because the mix our labor with the crown. I think that, that it's a very agrarian and a very market friendly vision. And I think, I don't know what, to what extent Hegel was actually familiar with the second treatise by Locke. I've never seen, does anyone know if he, if there's anything known about this? I, I'm not sure, but I, I mean, his vision is completely different. Um, so so that, that would be Maybe an interesting contrast here to to compare the log of the second treaties, including all the you know post-colonial critique that has been made of that, and uh, the Hegelian vision, and then of course there's also post-colonial critiques of that. But um, those are really very different and very strictly opposed visions of society that you find there. Um, yes, thanks. Uh Yes, thanks, Lisa. Um, Man, we have a few more questions uh, from the chat. I don't know. Maybe I can read it. Um, so I have uh, one question from Vera or Vera. I don't know how uh, how to pronounce it. Uh, her question uh, is uh, about which would be your point of view uh, regarding a certain interpretation from Hegelian corporations according to which they would be closer to pluralist associations and not necessarily or exclusively work related. And then uh, she says like Fivec, for example, reads Hegel's corporations in this pluralist sense. So which will be your uh, point of view regarding this issue? I, I, I have quite big sympathies for such a reading. I have also certain sort of sociological or empirically founded um, concerns about it in the sense that um, the if our society is organized such that people have to spend eight hours or more at work then I mean I mentioned this a little bit earlier then uh, 
how much time and energy is there that people can spend in other kinds of spaces and this sort of on, on this more pluralistic picture and i think um you know if we had i don't know a 15 hour work week as john Maynard Keynes imagined we would have it um then people would have you know lots of possibilities of um interacting with others in various kinds of associations but given that we are in a situation in which work is very central for many people, I mean, the colleagues that you see, in, I mean, not during Corona, but I mean, in, 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 in before Corona and hopefully at some point after Corona, your colleagues are really the people sometimes who spend more, life, more time with them than with your family members. Um, and, and, and so I think those social relations need to be crucial among the various relations that can take on the functions of the Hegelian corporations. And what I would not want to see is a kind of reading where these other kinds of associations would sort of replace what happens at the workplace. Um, so democratic workplaces together with others, other, other associations, yes, please. But I think it would be dangerous to say, oh, forget about the workplace, that's just um, a capitalist institution and we can't do anything about it anyway. Let's focus on other kinds of associations. I think we need to sort of really keep the workplace in mind and think about the centrality it has for most people. And if there's no reforms at that level, then I find it very hard to imagine how other associations on their own would bring about all the reforms that we would want to see and, and take on all the functions that Hegel sees in the corporations. Thanks, Lisa, for the answer. Uh, and uh, Inas would like to uh, ask you a question. I will hand over to Inasio. Thank you for your presentation. <clears throat> I would like to talk a little about public opinion. Uh, currently, the role of marketing is important in forming preference. It is very important in the economy. What is your view we, we, we on the role of the formation of public opinion in Hegel on consumer preference? Can corporation and the policy make any contribution in this context? Yeah, thank you. Um, that, that's an excellent question. And I think in a way, in the paper, I didn't deal with it because in Hegel's time, there was no marketing and there was no advertisement. I mean, I, I, I've, I've actually, when I was working on this paper, I started reading about the history of advertisement to check whether it was already happening at Hegel's time. But from what I've read from historians, it started only later. So that's a difference between Hegel's time and ours. And another difference is that, of course, he is not uh, a believer in representative democracy. And so in, in a sense, for him, public opinion plays a much more limited role for government than we would say today, because for him, it's a much it's much more important that the monarch and, you know, benevolent civil servants and then the representation of the corporations, these kinds of institutions do a good job. And public opinion doesn't have the kind of normative weight for him that one would see if one adopts, for example, a sort of Habermasian or Laclos-Mouf perspective on, okay, public opinion really shapes and should shape um, democratic politics. Um, so in that sense, I don't think we can get so much out of Hegel himself, but of course the question is a very legitimate one. Well, what does it mean for today? I mean, if you if you just ask me about, okay, what is my view on advertisement and PR and all these things, I would just say, okay, that's one of the areas where we really need massive market regulation. Because in a way, what we see today in many areas is that markets are very efficient at satisfying uh, the preferences that they create in the first place. So it's a sort of empty circle. It has nothing to do with people's genuine preferences because what they want is already constructed by market players. And then they say, oh, we are so good at fulfilling people's preferences. But that's just because they've created those preferences in the first place. So I think one has to be really careful here. And I mean, just as an aside, I'm, I'm, I, I'm currently also working on 
this argument that markets are so good in dealing with decentralized knowledge, this big defense by Hayek and others, markets are these knowledge machines, as it were. It doesn't quite work if the knowledge is all about manufactured preferences and all sort of mediated through advertisement. What kind of knowledge is that that markets are dealing with? It's, it's all artificial and it's not really normatively valuable as such. I mean, if I desire, I don't know, I don't drink this stuff, but Pepsi over cola or whatever, is that a valuable kind of information that a market should process? But but that that's a huge topic, I think, on its own. Um, nonetheless, I think that one shouldn't underestimate the extent to which the influence of advertisement on people is also in turn influenced by their social environment. And I mean, in some social contexts, um, people are ridiculed if they follow the latest, um, yeah, if they buy the latest gadgets or follow the latest trends, and then they don't do it. In certain countercultures, there is a very, you know, functional resistance to advertisement. And I think in other cultural milieus, it's attention to certain kinds of advertisement. And I think so so it's never we should we shouldn't have the kind of picture where consumers are just sort of passive playthings and the corporations put advertisement out there and then you know it's a blind herd of sheep just following. I think the social context does have a certain role on people. And of course, some social contexts are such that they encourage people to be very consumerist and they actually encourage people to always go for the latest gadget. And I mean, I think this passage from Hegel that I mentioned about the, the individual is not part of a corporation. In that sense, the people who don't have a sort of stable environment where they receive recognition from others, then those individuals might be particularly Sort of vulnerable for advertisement for material goods because that advertisement promises them that they will feel good and feel valuable and feel appreciated if they buy certain goods and there's sort of a you know pseudo replacement for real human interaction i get this new gadget and then others will recognize me i think that there's something true about that and if you think about the psychological mechanisms so i think the the, the social environment still plays a role and i think um you know from a democratic perspective, you know, a good democratic building or formation would also give people a healthy dose of skepticism towards the promises of advertisement. But I think this is also an area where there should just be really strict regulation um, of what companies can advertise, how they can advertise, especially towards children. I mean, those are, you know, the most vulnerable consumers, but also in general, I think it's just a sort of not worthy of a democratic society to let its public space be completely filled up with advertisement for stupid consumer goods. I mean, this is sort of, we should have better ways of filling our public spaces. But yeah, that's, that's not where we currently are. Do we still have a connection? Yes, thank you, Lisa. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I hope you still have breath for one more question. Uh, we have one more question from the chat and then we'll head towards the end of this first seminar. So the last question is from Ranieri Garcia and he asks how these two Hegelian models of taming markets can be actualized or even applied in this context of financialization or maybe financialization Yeah, thank you. Um, that, that's, a, that's a difficult one because I think both mechanisms have completely failed in the financial world. And this is one of the areas where markets have been most disembedded. Um, and uh, where the belief that markets shouldn't be regulated has actually been strongest. So, I mean, it, it depends a bit on which phenomena exactly you mean by financialization. Um, on the one hand, there is the sort of the, the power of financial markets and their influence on the rest of the economy. On the other hand, there is also some, some people mean by financialization that financial incentives are introduced in areas such as healthcare or education or whatever. And I think one should ideally treat those a little bit separately, but I'll, I'll just for now, for the sake of time, I'll, I'll keep them together. I think um, 
the external regulation of financial markets and of their impact on other areas um, of life. I mean, this we, we had the big crisis in 2008. Um, and since then, there has been talk of, OK, we need stricter regulations. Um, and very little has actually happened. And I think the explanation is that the lobbying power of financial institutions on the political system is actually extremely strong. And that means that in that area, it's sort of a more Marxist reality where the state really doesn't have the kind of counter power to, to regulate these kinds of entities. And in terms of um, corporations or anything like that, if the social environment of these people, bankers, traders and so on, is basically you're the best person if to earn most money, then this is a sort of anti-Hegelian socialization because it's a socialization that drives people to do exactly what Hegel says only happens to the person who doesn't have any kind of social environment. Um, but that was very much in a way what, what happened there. And at the same time, there was a sort of normative story about how financial markets did a lot of good to society and therefore all the striving for gains was actually legitimized. So people also had a sort of moral absolution from any kinds of restrictions. So they went into this mode of unlimited um, greed forevermore, which as I said earlier for Hegel was really a kind of pathology. Um, so I wrote a paper once um, arguing that, well, if you want to do something about this and if you want to, you know, put responsibility onto bankers, what you'd have to do is make them financially liable for all the harm that they might do if there's another financial crisis. So, you know, force them to put, I don't know, 50 percent of their salary into some kind of um, yeah, institution and they only get it back 10 years later after taxes, of course, if there have been no financial crisis, because then they would really, you know, feel the responsibility. Now, this is very crude, of course, and you have to think about the details. But the problem is that these people don't personally feel the negative impact of their activities, but can externalize those onto others or taxpayers when a bank gets bailed out because it's too big to fail. And that, in a way, is not what those who defend markets like Smith or Ricardo thought markets would be like. They thought in markets, everyone has to carry the responsibility for the consequences of their actions. But our financial system is so complex that we don't have this nexus between action and uh, liability any longer. And that You were frozen for a minute, for a few seconds. Uh, should I should I repeat something or was it still? You yeah, just still the last clear? part. You know, I just said at, at the end, it's sort of a toxic mixture. It, it calls itself free markets, but they're actually very feudal structures and the state capture and so on. So it's not at all what a benign market could ever be. It's, uh, one could really question the use of the term market for the financial system we have at the moment. There are some features of markets there, but there are also many other features that are actually not at all like markets. And so I think there's a lot that needs to be re-regulated there. Right, Lisa, thank you so much for answering all our questions and uh, considering the time frame limitation we have, we now have to head towards the end of this first seminar. Uh, in behalf of the organizing committee, I'd like uh, once again to thank Professor Lisa Herzog for joining us here today and for the great exposition. Uh, and I also would like to thank our colleagues that joined us per Teams, per Facebook, and so we appreciate the many questions that have been made. Uh, before we leave, uh, I'd like to uh, thank also our technical uh, team of Unicinos who helped us to organize this event through the platform teams, uh, who also are in the backstage here with us, Andresa Fernando, also Diego and Samuel who help us with uh, the uh, airing of this transmission through Facebook. 
And uh, I'd like to remind everyone that we will also uh, make this video available very soon uh, on our YouTube channel and we, all, we will also add Portuguese subtitles to it. Also, don't forget to check out the web page with information uh, to our next seminars. Uh, I hope to see you again next time and uh, I'd like to uh, give the floor to my colleagues if they want to say goodbye to our attendees. And I should add thanks to Poliana who's made all this possible, I think, together with others. So thank you to you as well. Thank you. <laughs> So I would only like to thank you again, Lisa, very much. It was a, a very interesting uh, debate, uh, amazing uh, lecture. And we hope that maybe in a post-coronavirus uh, scenario, we could welcome you here in Brazil, maybe in Campinas, maybe in Brasilia, or maybe in Porto Alegre. Let's hope for that. OK, thank you very much. <laughs> Um, yes, I also I just want to, to thank you, Lisa and Poliana for the organization. <laughs> and I also would like to thank you, um, Andresa and Fernando for the technical support. Um, I think it is all. <laughs> and also remember that um, in um, October, we will have um, Norbert Vatic as guest, um, and then in November, Frank Hude, and in December, Paul Arantes. Yes. Inácio uh, had to leave us, uh, so he wishes also uh, he would like to thank for for Lisa for Lisa uh, exposition, and uh, I would now finish then this uh, transmission and thank uh, my colleagues, thank Lisa for for this first seminar. Thank you, everyone. Bye. <laughs> Bye.